Eric yeah. Wickler, Louis Hasbrook, uh, Tim Smith, Deb Clemmer, Rich uh, Parasoliti, Ben Weil, Carolyn Mish. Uh, we have a quorum. So uh, Energy and Sustainability Commission meeting of July 9th is open. Uh, and the first item on the agenda is public comment. So if you have a comment about something that is not later on on the agenda, uh, I guess raise your virtual hand. Um, okay. I think that means, oh, we do, Eric. Uh, I just have a question. Thank you, Ben. Um, Eric Rodman, um, uh, Old Wilson Road, Florence. Uh, yesterday there was a, I didn't see it until now, a public pricing uh, meeting. Was that, was that recorded? Uh, I, you know, I believe that it, I, I believe mm -hmm. it was recorded. Okay, it but. Was, it was recorded. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It was an indicative price um, meeting. Right. Right. Thanks, Adele. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other public comment on subjects not in the agenda? Okay. Then let's go to the question of, of reviewing and approving the minutes from the last meeting, which was a special meeting of June 21st that happened at 10 p.m. Um, and I can share my screen. Uh, sorry, Susan. And I'm sorry, yeah, I apologize for being late, but, and I know that I'm sure Adele and others have spoken to this. Not yet. But, oh, nobody's spoken to anything yet? No public No, we opened for com public comment. I thought I saw none. <laughs> What's that? I. I thought I saw no public comment, so so we were just moving on. But if you oh, have nothing at all, no, this is just Denise. Um, have we talked? Uh, have we talked about Denise and the whole thing about heat pumps? Is that on the agenda? And uh, geothermal and the the um, information. Is, are we going to talk about it at that point rather than public comment? I just wanted to say a word in favor of it. Uh, but I. If it's on Maybe the agenda, you should. So, so here I'm going to share my screen so that you can okay. see everyone can see the agenda, um, and uh, so here, here is the agenda. Uh, so I don't think we had anything specific about. No, it's on there, okay. Uh, so if you want to share something, that's that's fine. Adele, did you want to say something first? And I can follow up. Uh, no, I did not. Um, the commission has already approved that resolution, and it's gone on to city council, and it's oh, on yeah. the agenda for city council Thursday, okay. Thursday night. So we don't need to do anything else here. Everybody's in favor of it, and you know we're in favor of it. Yay! Awesome. Yep. All done. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I guess I uh does has everyone had a chance to see the meeting minutes that Gabi sent out or those on the commission? Uh does anyone want to amend uh or comment on them or or uh recommend that we approve move that we approve them? I move that we approve them. Okay, I have a second. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, I guess I'll do a roll call. Am I doing this right? <laughs> no, usually, usually you have a motion and then it's seconded and then you have discussion. Oh, all right, any discussion? That's, that's Robert's rules of order. Okay, thank you, Eric, you're exactly right. Yeah, so any discussion on the uh, agenda? I think I'm hearing none. Shall I call the roll? To uh, or yeah. So, uh, uh, Deb Clemmer. Yes. Uh, Eric Winkler. Yes. Angie Gregory. Yes. Louis Hasbrook. Yes. Carolyn Mish. Yes. Uh, Rich Parsoliti. 
Uh, I'll abstain. Uh, Tim Smith? Yes. Okay. Uh, that is approved with one abstention. Um, okay, the next item is Landscape Committee. Um, and I want to just hand it over to Angie Gregory uh, to hear what we're going to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to keep this um, on the agenda until we had all the people necessary to really weigh in on um, the consideration to um, either bring back that committee if there's if there's enough um, interest in supporting projects that are coming out of um, central services or the DPW. Um, I know we kind of had like a generative discussion a few months ago with Tim about the um, pollinator seeding and getting the high school involved. Um, and so really wanting this request to be of service to those city departments. Um, and I think it's coming um, coming from a place of like putting similar attention into, um, into doing some sort of assessment like we do for um, auditing buildings to see how we can improve. Um, and there seems to be some interest from the community to, uh, you know, create the people power necessary to even do some of that work um, and could be through local landscape, um, you know, businesses that have um, residents interested in supporting that work, um, but basically just wanted to have a discussion about what's the appetite for something like that. And then with that also adding in something that came out of last week's or last month's um, public comment session with the um, Dark Skies Initiative um, group and the new ordinance that's been passed by the city to see if this would also fit as a topic for a landscape subcommittee to um, support some of the um, communications about these new ordinances and, and other programming that might need to come for um, enforcing some of that. So that's the topic. And I remember, Carolyn, you were like, this should really be something for us to have, you know, Rich and I don't know who else. Um, yeah, Rich and Tim and like, oh, we had a few um, um, meetings where not um, everyone was in attendance. So I thought it made sense for the bigger group, like you said, and especially those who are more intimately involved with, with those issues. And, and obviously, um, uh, Smith Oak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it um, makes sense, especially some of the newer members um, to sort of recap what, um, what came out of the um, pollinator or landscape subcommittee from last year and if there were any sort of unfinished items. So I don't know if um, Rich, you have any input on that? Because um, I, I wonder if then that could be the stepping stone for some you know, additional work um, or if, that let, if there were conversations there that were sort of not addressed that um, might make sense to move forward. Good, good question, Carolyn. Uh, so the, the last meeting that uh, we had was well over a year ago. And I think the what came out of that meeting, uh, which was a pollinator subcommittee meeting, is that we were going to do a pilot program uh, in conjunction with uh, Smith Folk on a piece of property that is right off of Route 9. And I believe that the commission approved funding for that project and then that was sort of tim and i have been in touch i think once or twice since then and tim i don't know if you've had the operational capacity to move on that project or not you're muted you're, you're muted tim <laughs> there we go uh so we purchased the seed we have it in house um we're trying to get it onto that property so it dries out a little because I want to plow it and then we're we're just going to disc it until the fall. So I have a dormant seed bed 
And then in late November, we're going to uh, seed it with some students and then run a brilliant over it and just push the seed in. But the problem just waiting for that land to dry out. So. But I still see that happening. I just I wish it would dry out now. Then we'd have all summer just to lightly disc it. And any uh, weeds that were growing up, we, we could just take care of that way. Okay, Th thank um, you. I think the other thing that came up at one of the more recent meetings um, with a discussion of this um, group of students at the high school and wondering if there were areas at the high school, at Northampton High School, that could um, also um, accommodate um, pollinator seeds, like sort of experiments with either the hillside or other locations that are not necessary, that are just sort of grass now. Um, and I think uh, if I recall, there was also, um, I don't know if it was in the context of this meeting or someone reached out to me separately asking about um, student group at the high school also thinking about um, experimenting with um, green infrastructure around the high school and infiltration of um, maybe perhaps roof runoff. Um, and that takes a little bit more effort and investigation. Obviously, we need to understand what the soils are and the, and the grading and all of that. But I don't know if that might be something that just that high school group wants to take on or if there's some collaboration or guidance that might come from this committee um, to look at um, ways of better managing stormwater maybe starting at one school as a demonstration and then looking at um, potentially other school buildings as well. Um, I know that we have, the, um, our department took on, um, had hired a consultant to help us look at um, sort of pilot projects for um, areas to um, where we're having some issues with stormwater and whether we could in implement um, green solutions essentially and um, soften the um, surfaces in order to um, help with managing that stormwater. And a couple of the schools that, um, there were a couple of schools that were thrown in the mix to look at um, those uh, uh, sort of a de designs with nature project. And one of them was at Smith Folk and the other was Jackson Street School. Um, so the idea has been kicking around a bit and then this, the um, high school, I don't know if it was a teacher or a parent of one of the club members reached out about uh, potentially looking at the high school for that. Oh, what do you mean, Carolyn, about softening the services? Is that just like from impaction or something like that from... Yeah, just greening, essentially creating a green uh, planted solution um, for stormwater yeah. runoff. So either converting um, hard surface to um, planted oh, um, swales or um, converting existing, you know, compacted lawn area or right. just lawn area to something that's really more conducive to um, handling runoff whether it's roof runoff or even coming off of parking lots, um, whatever, wherever that, whatever that may be. <clears throat> that um, piece, I think, is a little bit more labor intensive. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the creating pollinator um, fields is also ultimately takes a lot of work and there's a transition period and all of that. Um, so, um, but there may be some more um, engineering that might be necessary for looking at stormwater management or, um, you know, um, green infrastructure conversion at some of these locations. Yeah. Well, what, do, what, what does everyone think about like the appetite for doing some sort of just a general audit about, you know, um, some of these publicly managed spaces, you know, like maybe it is just school by school, but um, 
I, I don't even know what all the spaces are. I'm sure there's the senior center and, and various parks and, um, but I think the idea was like, if we had something to reference, there would be a way to kind of prioritize. Um, though an ad hoc approach also works. I mean, I mean, certainly in service to um, diverting water from entering buildings, but I think, um, yeah, other other ways that the, the water is not infiltrating and creating other issues, other places. Um, and, and maybe there's different practices um, that can support the reduction of that as well as intentional plantings and things like that. But so I, I just am curious um, if even doing something like that would, would lead to um, the ability for those shifts to happen. I, I don't really, really know what the limiting factors might be. So I guess that would be helpful for me to understand if it's even feasible. You know, what's the capacity, the staff capacity, resources, that kind of thing. I mean, I, I, I think that there are, that, that, that we, we kind of have, the idea of a subcommittee is partly to decide some of these things, right? To put together enough people who have expertise and interest to go and figure out what to focus on and, and how to, how to apply resources. You know, as I see it, you've got kind of pollinators and stormwater that may be the same project, but they don't have to be right. You you could find something that's not really going to be helpful in managing stormwater, but is a nice location to increase pollinator habitat. And you can have another place where the best solution for dealing with stormwater might not create a huge pollinator habitat. Um, but you know, and and I would say ad hoc is probably not the best way to go because like finding those places where you've got a lot of runoff or a lot of lot of soil compaction or something that's a specific problem seems like you find the problem and then you go solve that. That's just my opinion. Um, and then you're focusing on city-owned property, um, but it may be that a really large impact, both pollinators and stormwater, could be what are some of the practices that residents could do, um, and how how can you know how can we get whether it's just information or other resources or um, you know, volunteers, like, again, I don't know the answer. I'm just, just thinking like figuring out what category you want to address and then seeing if we've got the people for a subcommittee. Hmm. Yeah. That... Rich, what do you, do you, did you have a thought? I thought I saw you come in with something. I, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> I want to hear them all. I have 35 years worth of thoughts. Um, okay. Okay, just I the mean, bridge so, version then. <laughs> so well, no, I mean, so you know, our our tree planting initiative, we're uh, about ten years into it, and the tree planting initiative has been extremely successful for a multitude of reasons because it's really, it really is truly urban and community forestry. Yeah. So I think the community piece of that is really what is um, the driving sustainable force. You know, obviously yep. the, the the city budget that the the last two administrate this administration, the previous one, have provided with the support of the city council and the support of the uh, department head, it's also been a driving force. But I, you know, I'm just one. I'm one person in the tree warden, and we do have uh, staff capacity at DPW. But the majority of the actual work that's done to implement any of this, and that includes the public outreach part of it as well, is all done either by the city's urban forestry commission and through tree Northampton. And also I might add through the uh, high school environmental club and also uh, friends in Northampton trails. So okay. we spent, we spent a lot of time trying to facilitate those relationships and sort of massage them over the last 10 years, which is, you know, created uh, a sustainable model that um, a lot of folks in the Commonwealth have asked a lot of questions about. So, you know, I think, and, and we, we started small. It was, we, we, hit, we started in a small area. We uh, folks got a, we got a foothold and then we sort of just sort of grew. But I think the important thing, and, I'll, and I agree with what Ben said, is that um, the, the, there's, there's, there's public property, 
that could be utilized for some of these potential prog prog um, projects. But I think private property and getting the educational piece to private property owners and homeowners is really, I think, extremely important because without mm -hmm. without the public and without the residents and the property owners actually buying into the tree planting initiative that we had, we wouldn't have captured as many setback trees, for example, that we have. Um, people wouldn't be, it would be more difficult to plant trees in the public right away. So just getting people right. to sort of do the mind shift of thinking about looking at their lawn differently other than just green grass and potentially putting uh, a pollinator planting there or some other, um, um, you know, herbaceous shrub or shrubs or a planting bed instead of actually out there mowing the lawn every day and you know not every day but mowing it once a week etc and using you know uh, uh, a combustion engine to do the work etc i mean there's there's a lot of education i think that could go into this probably and i think that it would be the best way to figure out what educational component we want would be to have a smaller group of people work um together like a subcommittee but I also think it would be helpful to reach out to the other stakeholders that have sort of been in the in the pipeline of the tree initiative to maybe get some assistance. What works, what doesn't work, you know, because we're you know we're pollinators and and stormwater runoff is one is one one facet of how we can control it. The other facet is tree planting, right, and herbaceous shrubbery and like the Milwaukee Forest method, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different ways of going about this. It's just a question of what, what, what can we focus on and where can we do it and who has the bandwidth. So I think it's good. It would be good for us to reach out to other um, entities that, that, we have, that we've utilized so far, which is our own public tree commission um, and those other groups, Tree Northampton and other volunteer groups like Friends of Northampton Trails. I mean, Friends of Northampton Trails has been great because they've helped us maintain the uh, stormwater uh, planting, the stormwater planting is like on King Street and Pleasant Street. So they volunteered. So that's just my, just my, my, my thought on it. I think before we, before we actually do X, we need to figure out, or before we do Y, we need to get to X in essence. What, what do we want to do? Who do we want to reach and what do we want to reach them with? Mm -hmm. And you're saying to reach out to those existing stakeholders to kind of mimic the programming or to actually see if they'd, they'd be interested in participating or both? I, I think a combination of the two. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, it's what, why reinvent the wheel if something works well. If you can have uh, information from others, information is power, helpful. It'll be good. Um, I don't want to volunteer anyone, but Jen Warner, who's a commissioner for... Um, for the uh it's been a, a long was a long time um horticulture teacher for like 30 something something years so jen brings a lot of horticulture knowledge to our urban forestry world because we mainly focus on trees but jen is focused on obviously a much broader landscape as well so we ha we do have some uh great people on the commission that might be interested in, in trying to partner with this or trying to at least give some advice and information great so Eric Winkler had his hand up. He went down, but I don't know if you still want to say anything. Yeah, I, I yeah, I just have two two thoughts. One, I, I mean, with, with respect to um, stormwater, that that's that's codified somewhere in in our in our rules. No, I mean, when you build when you build something, you have to deal with stormwater in the city. So that you know and that's not to say that um there isn't potentially some work that could be done on that to include some different types of stormwater management techniques um like using you know plantings as opposed to some other kind of infiltration basin and or porous pavement but i think for stormwater that's that's it's already it's already part of the city's uh you know sort of control over development um so that could feed could feed into this if you want to address address those standards um the other thing that i was 
thinking about um, was, you know, this 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 group could potentially encourage the city to adopt a more progressive approach towards reconstruction of paved services surfaces. So, for you know, there are pretty pretty good technology for porous pavement that could handle parked cars so that when the city is thinking about repaving a parking lot, they could think about repaving the parking lot with porous pavement instead of instead of impervious pervious surface. So that's something just I'm guess I'm just feeding an item into what this group might consider um, uh, developing because that seems like a good practice. Um, I, I haven't heard too. I, I used to do stormwater stuff in my UMass days, so I have a little experience with the technology. Um, but I haven't heard anything bad about porous pavement. I mean, you don't want it on a traveled way, but for a parking area that has slow moving vehicles and then just sitting cars, that's a that's a great way to avoid creating impervious surface. So, so two things. One is, you know, what what are the already we already have a standard practice for stormwater uh, management and um and then are there options for the city to take a position that's more uh, innovative in terms of their own their own practices are you self selecting to be on the subcommittee eric is that what <laughs> I did write a manual for the state on stormwater technology. I, I have I have some background on stormwater. Um, I, I may be an agronomist, but I don't know much about plants. <laughs> but yeah, I, I I'd be I'd be okay having having some involvement in that. I'm not volunteering at all to be on this subcommittee, but I just want to <laughs> sort of um, I um, just note follow up on what Eric was saying is I think certainly what we've been looking at it, um, relative to stormwater and green infrastructure isn't so much about the regulatory structure because yes, we have that for all the projects starting from whenever it was. 2000, 1999 forward, but for all the other stuff that's been built out before that, there isn't the same kind of system. And as we're getting more intense rainfall, we need to go back and adjust all of the built out areas already. So for example, the high school has been there for decades. Jackson Street has been there and built over a wetland, and that's causing a lot of problems now. The chickens are coming home to roost. So how do we retroactively go back and demonstrate? I mean, I think that's why, you know, we could create an opportunity to talk about things for the private sector. But at the same time, maybe, I mean, there's some things that we need to take care of as a city, Um that um, and with also thinking about low maintenance because of capacity issues um, that, you know, we can show that, OK, we need to go back and retroactively fix these things that were done poorly when they were first built or without thought about, you know, potential impact. So I think that's where that stormwater piece comes from. And and so um, I think we're, we're we have a good um, grounding on the regulatory structure and what's required for people, you know, from now forward. Um, so I, I would suggest we don't necessarily need to structure or look at regulatory um, mechanism. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, I just want to follow up on that, Karen. You know, so in the early 2000s, Massachusetts implemented a pretty rigorous stormwater management policy and basically said, you know, we're going to the next level to deal with stormwater. And the city implemented a surcharge for stormwater for based on impervious surface of residential and I'm assuming commercial industrial as well. My my view and I'm not criticizing any humans, I'm just saying my view is that that process is pretty kludgy. 
It doesn't address whether somebody has an infiltration garden that they installed or changed their driveway to impervious surface or some some other other things. So this group could actually make a pretty big impact on um the, well, I know from a residential standpoint, um it's a it's a chunk of change that we pay every month, you know, every quarter for stormwater abatement. Um, and it 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 doesn't, I don't know who is going out and reassessing what the impervious surface is. Um that that being said, this group could develop policies and information for homeowners to recognize that. Well, you know what? If you go ahead and need to repave your driveway, you have an opportunity to use a different technology that could actually lower your water bill because you're going to pay less on the stormwater surcharge. So th those are the kind of things that would definitely benefit the community and residents of Northampton by, by developing a more, I would say, transparent process for dealing with the stormwater abatement charge. and um, you know, on on top of all the city's practices, which which could be pretty pretty significant in in terms of the infrastructure that that it has to manage. So, I just Carol, I had to follow your 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 lead on that because it it reminded me when you know my water bill went up one hundred and twenty five dollars a a quarter because of well maybe it wasn't that much but it was it was it was it was tens of dollars seventy bucks I think a quarter. So, and that, that, you know, I don't know if people are complaining about that. It's been around for a while. Um, but I remember when, when the state implemented that and the cities had to go ahead and incorporate that into their rate utility rate structure, that it was a pretty, pretty significant, I thought. Anyway, sorry, I'll stop. I, <laughs> I, I will leave it to those with longer time in the city to answer the details. I, I think that the assessment um, uh, is done, you know, through a satellite approach and it's, and it is fairly rough. I remember looking into detail at the, um, how you could get an abatement to say, oh, well, no, look, I put in this uh, rainwater detention basin, or I repaved my driveway with in, with uh, in, uh, with permeable paving and so forth, and it's not enough to simply do it. Uh, you you really had to get significant civil engineering done in order to prove that it it would do what it said it would do, basically, which seemed to me to be essentially a barrier to entry. Um, so. There are kind of two two sides of this. One side is sure we could try and find a way to pre-engineer and like pre-stamp approaches so that it could be easier to to go implement um, uh, stormwater management on properties. And I think that's would I I love that. The other side though is um, the DP the the DP uh, DPW needs um, needs the money. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there's so much stormwater generated by all of the impervious surfaces in the city. And there are these few choke points that are very, very expensive to try to remediate. But that's neither here nor there. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, if I can, if I can just add to that, I mean, so um I mean, stormwater is hard and is something, you know, I, I, I think has been on tap to, um, to, to look at, um, for a while now and, um, and reassess, but I think it's, it's really important to understand that it is, it's unlike water usage, which, you know, really is like, you can sort of measure like individual households, water usage, the, the degree to which, um, stormwater management is a shared responsibility with shared risk to us all. I mean, even uh, folks have a way of being like, well, I'm not in a low spot. It doesn't affect me. Why is this a problem for me? Um, you just gotta, um, I don't know that I'm contributing very much to this conversation other than to say that, that one of the things you'll hear Donna 
uh, director Lascaglia talk about is, is how difficult it is or to kind of apply those kind of metrics that we use for, for, um, you know, water to the, the same way that we have to, you know, ha have the collective shared costs, bear the collective shared cost of dealing with, um, 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 rainwater and, um, that kind of thing. So just put that out there. So the good ideas, and we certainly want to encourage people to do those things. It's difficult to tie it to the enterprise that um, it keeps us all from being flooded. That's all. So, so given the, the time that we, we spent on, on the subject, I, I'd like to throw out a, a suggestion, uh, which is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And it would be great, I think, for someone, maybe Angie, to uh, uh, designate herself as uh, to, to maybe connect uh, uh, through Rich with uh, Tree Northampton, with uh, Friends of Northampton Trails, and see what they're doing, right? And and kind of see what what resources and efforts are already out there and what people are likely to want to do, um, and then be able to decide whether do we need a committee of this commission or we, or is it just that we need to better understand whether what they're doing and find out how we as a commission can make recommendations that would help support them to do more because i feel like that's where we don't really know what's our best role um and uh in, unless any of the other commissioners has has something to say on this i'll uh i'll let eric Broadbent speak if you because he raised his hand and then maybe move on to the other agenda items. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, did you, uh, Broadbent, did you still want to speak? I'll just say we did have to have a stormwater agreement as part of our bill with the mayor, and it was designed by Berkshire Design Corp. And a year in, we had to have it redone. Um, because the flows were either higher than anticipated or the measures weren't uh, sufficient. Uh, it's amazing how much flow uh, can build up. Uh, but part of that is maintenance. You, if you have hard, if you have hard measures such as stone swales and culverts and redirects, um, level spreaders, you need to keep them clear. And that's very difficult. So any low maintenance measures are really going to pay the dividends down the road where <laughs> you don't have to keep clearing them. Um, so uh, just speaking from experience, it's, it is a big deal. And the flows are more than the mass, the standards of, you know, 100 year storms or whatever, and how that gets calculated into design are so Oh, they're they were they're old and they need to be updated. So, thanks. Sorry. Great. Uh, so, if there's no other comments on this subject, um, and I don't know if Angie and Rich, you feel that that's a reasonable kind of next step is just to reach out to those other groups and see what resources are best deployed. Sure, okay. I'm fine with that. If Rich is, he's kind of more of the um, connection point, I think, to most of those groups. So I'd be relying on you um, somewhat in that process, but I'd be happy to do it with you. Okay. And then, well, you know, we, we could, yeah, we could take it offline and do that. Yep. All yeah. Right. And then yep. circle back. Right. So the next, uh, the next subject is a really quick update from Gabriella on SREC payments for Florence Fields. Dobby, do you? Yes, I'm sorry, unmuting. Um, yes, so really quick. Um, so I didn't mention this at the last special meeting, but we were not getting, we stopped getting SREC payments um, in July of 2022. Um, and so part of when, um, when we're trying to fix Florence Field in terms of underproduction, we'll also be fixing um, the issue with the meter, which is outdated. Um, so it's not, um, reporting SREX. Um, it's not reporting production. So um, so hopefully we'll be getting uh, SREC payments soon. Um, as of right now, um, it's about 
$4,000 that we're missing out on since 2022, since the meter stopped working. Um, so yeah, just wanted to provide that update. Um, and we are working on that um, to fix the issue and someone should be coming out to look at Florence Field soon. Uh, we just have to schedule that and it should be back up and running soon, hopefully. That's it. Okay. Um, unless anyone has any comment on that, I'll briefly give you a status report on the subject of charging for public EV charging, um, which is, uh, at, as you may know, that the city is uh, ha has been uh, electric vehicle, ch vehicle charging in town on public chargers has been free for the past uh, just over a decade. Um, at which means the city has been losing about forty-four thousand dollars a year, or roughly a a, a teacher's aid, yeah. uh, the salary, and um, so the question was how to start actually charging money for it. So we are going to start, although we don't have a start date yet, um, but uh, we calculated that to break even, it would. Uh, require charging about uh, two dollars and fifty cents an hour. Uh, so for your average car charging, that would that would break even. Um, there there were moves uh, to revise the ordinance, the parking ordinance, to make this possible. And after consultation with uh, the city solicitor we discovered that we can actually run things exactly as they are being run with no ordinance changes. Um, and we simply need to change the price and announce that we're changing the price. Um, so that is the current status. Um, and we don't, but we're not starting it yet until we actually have a fund into which to deposit the revenue. And that fund will be used to pay the electric bills of the buildings to which the electric vehicle chargers are now connected. Um, and that should basically break a, break even each year. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, Louis. All right, what happens when the, we, they've tried um, card readers in the chargers very early in the process and they didn't work out all that well. And so I just encourage if, if the, card reader fails, can the charging station stay on for free as opposed to being off because it can't accept money? That was one of the discussions. I think that happened perhaps 10 years ago. Hmm. Uh, I would say the main story is that uh, there is the charge point connect. So it's mostly the charge point network, the cell cellular network that was the problem. There are still connectivity problems. Um, we will continue to be running it from Kappa. <laughs> we had originally thought that parking management would run it, but we'll just continue doing that. Um, it's better. Um, generally speaking, ChargePoint can't unlock the charger if it can't read a, a credit card, even if it's free. So it's not about the amount of money, it's about the connectivity. Um, and that's, I, I don't think that's like a problem we can solve, but usually it's not a problem, you know, it's because it's about connectivity. Um, ben, ben I, I have a question. So is, is, is this a service that the city is going to engage to operate these charge points? We already do. <laughs> we are, we are already paying them, uh, just under $7,000 a year for the privilege of using their uh, cloud service and administering the charge point chargers that the city already purchased and operates. Uh, and then on top of that, obviously we pay for the electricity that goes into the cars. Um, and then we also uh, pay some, uh, uh, some uh, maintenance fees and so forth. So this, uh, the only difference is that charge point will take a 10% cut as part of processing the payments and then doing the direct deposit into the city's bank account. So, so that will, that will cover points uh, uh, in 
in the in the city's infrastructure in terms of buildings and downtown park like parking that's a any uh ev charger that is owned by the city and is open to the public to use okay uh, would it, you'd connect in the same way that you do right now you still need an app or a card to unlock it to plug your car in the only difference is the price instead of being zero dollars will be two dollars and fifty cents per hour um although i'm going to recalculate to make sure that i get exactly as close as i can to a break-even price so it might be a little lower yeah I'd, I'd be happy to help you with looking at the retail tariff for you um on oh that. it's not it's not even like that it's just purely what what are you paying for electricity on the account of the building that it's in yeah and what are you paying for your annual membership to your annual cloud service and then dividing that by the speed of charging yeah so are are these chargers limited in terms of what their capacity is like are they are, fixed like 10 kilo these are, these are level two chargers that charge uh at a maximum of 7kw okay all right that's all i need to know <laughs> all right um so i does anyone have any anything else on that subject okay so the next one is um a, a, something i actually would love some feedback on so um i've shared with you uh a memo and a sample policy um, and I'll just explain to you briefly what, what's going on. So the, the current vehicle procurement policy basically says you should try and buy an EV or a hybrid if you're purchasing a vehicle. One of my goals for the city for this year is to uh, qualify and, and be accepted into the climate leader program that is uh, run by the DOER Green Communities Program. Uh, the main benefit to us of that is that we can apply for bigger grant amounts from uh, from green communities. So it's it's basically it's just worth more money. <laughs> so uh, to do that, uh, uh, you have to do all the things that we already have as as green communities. Um, and uh, the the last two things we needed to do is have a vehicle procurement policy that prioritizes battery electric uh, first, plug-in hybrid second, hi um, hybrids third, and lastly, uh, a high or highest efficiency vehicle in class for those that are not available in those other priorities. So that's a requirement for participation. We have to adopt a policy. Um, so I proposed to the mayor that we adopt basically that policy, but I wanted to modify it by also saying, let's have another part of the policy, another gate that says, essentially, are we getting the best bang for our buck? Are we getting a, a vehicle that not only has the lowest carbon emissions in its lifetime, of its life cycle, including the, the carbon emissions associated with building the battery and, and all the, the life cycle part of it, but also the life cycle costs of ownership. You know, are, are we doing as well as we can by the public uh, dollar? Um, so that's what I proposed to her. Um, and basically there's there's a, a, a way to calculate all that. And I can show you a kind of a nice graphics version of that that lays out all the various vehicles and you can compare them. Um, but so part of that policy or implementation of that policy is to try and run vehicle procurement through CAPA. Um, so a giant power grab. <laughs> and the, the reason for that is in the end, uh, uh, Will Coffey, who's the procurement officer, does have to sign off on all these procurements. And they have to go through statewide contracts and all that stuff. Um, but what we're finding is people are requesting vehicles that they want and then post hoc generating the justification as to why they fit a policy. And we thought it would be better if they said, here's the functions of a vehicle that I need, and here's why I need those functions. 
And then we can keep a good database updated of what vehicles are actually available and which are the ones that best meet those needs while minimizing costs and carbon emissions. So that's the general concept of the policy. Um, and I can share more or I can open it up to discussion if you, if people have thoughts. I, I would and, just, I mean, it seems really well fleshed out and maybe it, you don't need any more support in, in doing something like this. I just happen to be participating at my workplace in the mass fleet advisor and it's, you know, it's something that they can do and take it to account like vehicle reserves and scheduled replacements and things like that. But it's like, it seems like you have everything you would need to do that. I just don't know if um, additional support like that could be useful for whoever that falls on in terms of like managing vehicle reserves and and that, I don't know where that so lands. That, that sounds like it goes beyond what we're talking about. This is actually about oh, okay. not just procurement, but actually managing the, the fleet that you have, which I think would be very useful for us and we are trying to get our arms around that um uh, councillor elkins so you had your hand up. um i can offer that um so a lot of that already goes into the the process of the capital improvement projects um pop, um process which uh goes on you know kind of starts in the fall and then goes through usually we usually we um pass the five-year resolution um and then the in in early january early february i think um and i'm i'm on the the cip advisory committee um which is it's just it's just that we don't decide anything we don't earmark any money just in case anybody's wondering we don't spend any money and we also don't um uh you know, we don't decide. It's ultimately the mayor's um, decision, but each of the department heads, just to explain how the process goes, the, each of the department heads um, lay out what they ant are anticipating for their CIP, um, their for their capital improvement projects. Um, and they lay it out by that fiscal year and then four years after that. So you kind of have a roadmap um, going forward. And then each of the department heads um, come and talk to the advisory committee and tell us about their projects. Um, cars are a big part of that. And starting, I think, three or four years ago, we started, I mean, kind of, I guess, an informal policy of saying when folks were coming to ask for cars um, to, to, to suggest that they go back and can you tell us what you looked at in terms of hybrid or electric and things like that. So I think it makes a lot of sense. I, the, and I know it fits in already with what the mayor is already doing. So um, all that is to say, I, I I think we're already doing it, like putting it on informally, making it formal. Um, I, I guess my experience, so we recently had some, some procurement requests um, from DHHS. And the issue is that they come in knowing the vehicles that they want. But those are not necessarily the best vehicles for the job. Um, the, the selection process is, is not as rigorous. And so in this case, for instance, uh, were we to simply, yep, rubber stamp, those are your vehicles you get, I suspect they would be significantly oversized uh, for what's required. And moreover, this particular ones wouldn't be eligible for the direct pay, which of course you can't expect them to pay attention to all of these these factors, but that's one where we can actually get a tax rebate. And so we wanna try to maximize that sort of thing. Um, so the, the basic concept is instead of asking, what vehicle do you want? Ask what functions do you want? Yeah, and I think I think that's, that's sort of the transition that we're in with having you in place now, which is that we were asking, um, and the mayor's office, I guess through us, the mayor's office that mm -hmm. through that committee was asking department heads to look at that and, and consider those questions. But um, I think greater coordination and a policy would probably, well, I can't speak for department heads, but it seems like it would help them a lot. Um, so I, I guess um, 
I mean, I guess what I'm, I'm, I think I'm hoping for. So as, as far as I understand, this can be a policy. The mayor can just declare it a policy and that, and that, that can be done. Um, so I, I wonder if I could get from the commission some expression of, we think this is a good idea. We recommend it to the mayor, essentially just a little uh, mark of approval. If if that's a, a value, or people feel comfortable with that, yes, Rich. And I was just curious: um, were any of the department heads that actually purchase multiple multiple pieces of equipment that have fleets here consulted on this policy? No. So just sort of putting my operational cap on. Um, I think it might be helpful. For I mean, a police, fire, public works. Um, oh yeah, those are all exempted already. All the so there's a they, class well, of exempt vehicles. All okay, of but those, not, but, but not, but not. So there would be all, but that doesn't specifically say that in the policy. That it may, it may, but I may not have seen it. But it says it in the actual policy, not in the memo. But if you look at okay. the um, uh let's see exempt vehicles is under definition e vehicles that are exempt from the green community's fuel efficient vehicle policy include off-road vehicles motorcycles heavy duty vehicles with a manufacturer's gross vehicle weight of more than 8,500 pounds examples include fire engines ambulances and some public works vehicles yeah so so there are some public works vehicles so i just my point is is that i think it would be it would be helpful, I think, maybe just to have, and this can, the mayor can do that. This is obviously, um, you know, a mayoral decision in the end, obviously, but I think it would be helpful to have department head input across the board before we, and before we, I would feel comfortable doing that and asking for the input before we rolled out a policy or excuse me, recommended to the mayor to roll out a policy that may impact department heads in a way that they may not uh, be necessarily uh, up, up to speed with. Right, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's a good policy. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a definitely an achievable goal, I, but I think the department head input probably would be beneficial uh, Right. In, in both directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so Deb raised her hand. Um, how many vehicles are we, do you think this would affect every year? How many vehicles are purchased that would fall into this category? Um, uh, you know, we didn't actually look at that. Gavi, did you get a sense of that um, from Will? We, we, we were trying to assess how many uh, it counted as, and, and we were looking at numbers that, that were less than 10. Yeah, I don't know that number. I know there's two right now that were, they're actively purchasing right now, um, but I don't know the number like per year, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, if it's a couple, I mean, is it, and they're kind of uh, purchasing them with, you know, these goals in mind already, it seems like a lot of energy and time to put into something that would only affect maybe not even a handful of vehicles every year. Um, well, a but a vehicle lasts for 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so once you've made a commitment to that vehicle, you're now stuck with it and you start to build a fleet of one type or another. Um, and so the prior policy, the way it was written, so the department heads were supposed to fill out this little uh, kind of a spreadsheet um, and ex explain what they wanted and what it was. And the question was asked, would a hybrid work for you? So the, the last question on that spreadsheet, which I don't happen to have up, mm -hmm. but the way it was phrased actually implied, you know, you should probably get a hybrid, not a battery electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. Um, and if, first of all, this, if we want to do the climate leader thing, we actually do have to explicitly prioritize the battery electric vehicles. So we want to have a policy one way or the other, uh, that 
follows their kind of minimum directive. Um, but the other th thing is in many cases, in actually in most cases, a battery electric vehicle will actually have a lower cost of ownership to the city than a hybrid or even most internal combustion engine vehicles that are kind of of your light truck passenger uh, vehicle variety. Um, or at least you can find models that do that. And then you can also find models that cost a whole lot <laughs> and will have a really, really high uh, life cycle cost of ownership. And part of the goal is to avoid over-purchasing a vehicle, you know, getting vehicles with more capability than is required. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and do does the city keep the vehicles for 15 years? Because it, um, I know the uh, police department, they um, turned over the vehicles more rapidly because they use 27 right. and yeah. you know, have much greater usage than your average car would or yeah. SUV. We have Nissan Leafs that are, um, you know, an earlier generation of, of EV that are still uh, being operated by the city. Yeah, Angie? Yeah, just um, just another quick um, question, and maybe there was an addendum to this about um, the charging infrastructure that's going to be necessary, or, or what the charging practices would be for each of the different city departments that maybe don't already have it, um, so that they have a clear understanding of what they're, you know, how it's all going to work. Yep, we are working on that right now. <laughs> so uh, as you may know, the Department of Health and Human Services purchased two large electric vans, but didn't uh, organize a way to charge them. Now we have solved the short-term needs of getting them charged because Tim has agreed to uh, set them up with the ability to charge at Smith Vogue, um, which has uh, the, I think eight ports and you know level two chargers. We are in the process of getting four level three chargers in the roundhouse lot, one of which will be a municipal vehicles only. So you can kind of rotate through them and the other ones will be reservable by the municipal vehicles. So the idea is as you're coming in to do some paperwork or whatever, you throw it on the charger 15 minutes, you know, you're, you, you would change practices. We often think of EVs as something as you plug in at night and in the morning they're fully charged and you run them all only all, during the day and then you charge them at night. This would change the pattern. You're going to top them up some and kind of like take what you can get from the fast chargers while you're doing paperwork or whatever it is, you, you know, whatever stop in, in, uh, in, in downtown. And then of course, there's also increased charging facilities. That's the other part of it is to make sure that when you purchase a vehicle that does require charging, that you've planned for the charging um, as, as part of the process we wanna make sure happens. I figured you guys were on it. I just didn't see it here. I didn't know if people would receive that and be like, um, what do, how do I, how do I fuel this thing? Well, that's exactly, I mean, that's exactly the problem that put us onto this was that these vans all of a sudden appeared and nobody had really planned about how to, how to charge them or even how to fit them into a space with a charger. Um, so, you know, like plan, planning ahead is, is a good thing. So we thought having a policy that, made sure that you'd actually checked all those boxes would be helpful. Um, that, so, so this would, in a certain way that like the DPW has a large fuel tanks and you basically municipal vehicles fuel up there. This would essentially function, these four fast chargers would function as the equivalent municipal charging station. Uh, Eric. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, very supportive of this. I, I I mean, I could talk about electric vehicles for 100 years. Um, one point I want to make is uh, for, for you, Deb, also is is that, you know, part of the life cycle savings on electric vehicles is reduced maintenance. These these types of vehicles require a much different level of uh, of maintenance as compared to an internal combustion engine 
also hybrids um, provide minimal additional value. I think uh, there are, there are opportunities for hybrids that have value with respect to short short uh, short trips where you can do regenerative braking and and operate mostly off of the battery, but really it's pretty limited. So so full full on electric plugins are the way to go. Um, the other thing, Ben, I don't know if you've done research on this, but I seem to recall that there are, will be opportunities for um, resources to, to support the infrastructure development that needs to happen to handle all electric vehicles. Um, and so, you know, the city may, you know, may have to plunk down some money right now, but I think going forward, um, I think I, I, I imagine that, uh, um, the state and or the feds will provide opportunities for, for, um, subsidizing, um, the infrastructure that's, that's going to be required. And I don't want to talk about the electric grid and how it's going to handle all that. Cause that's like a whole different <laughs> A whole different zoo to that is, yeah. Go so to. I will tell you that these four fast chargers that are coming will in, in the end cost the city zero dollars. Great. That's a good price. Yeah, that's that that's let's do more of that. Well, that's the deal we're working on, but um yeah, that's yeah, that and I mean I, 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 I would only be concerned about talking to department heads if you think that there's going to be pushback from department heads on, on this well, I think. I think Rich is suggesting there might be, <laughs> especially especially if they were not consulted first. Is, is that accurate, Rich? Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, I'm not saying there'll be there would necessarily be push pushback. I just think it would be helpful to have a conversation with yeah. department heads yeah. with a policy that's this broad that affects a lot of different departments. Um, that that's all. That makes a lot of sense. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I would ask the department heads if they have a problem with the, you know, point read read the policy and point out ahead of time so that it needs to be tweaked because it just simply doesn't make sense. Um, that that being said, I don't know all the department heads, so I I can't say whether you know there's you know, uh, um, resistance because of something other than this is this is the way the world is moving. We we don't have a we don't have a choice anymore. Um, and shortly shortly won't have a choice. Uh, Louis, um, I think that it would be worth putting a presentation together to present at the department head meeting the the monthly meetings yeah. because yeah. I think a lot of department heads are going to be confused about it. And what do you mean I can't? Blah blah blah. Um, mm -hmm. um, so that you can. Explain. I think just explaining it, um, yeah. you know, given the whole cost-benefit analysis spiel, and see where it goes from there. Yeah, I, 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 my yeah. perspective. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say my perspective is that I think it's just a change. You know, at, at each department has always been told that they're responsible for their own stuff. Right? They yeah. have to, you know, organize and figure out what they need to buy, including these this equipment because they know best of what they're and we just didn't have the capacity to sort of look at a bigger level and say okay well wait a second are we going to organize all of this I mean we don't have a common fleet many communities have a com common fleet and you just go in you check out the car and you're done and so that's already handled at sort of the higher mm -hmm. level and so this is just I think the issue is it's a, a big shift and that that's that they just need to be, you know, needs to be explained. But I think that's a great idea to go to the department heads meeting with sort of a presentation. Yeah. Mar Marissa? Um, I just, I just wanna, I, I, it really is the case that, I mean, this convert, um, I wouldn't anticipate pushback um, just because it has been now the case for a, a few years now that department heads are in, I mean, so not every department head is in these presentations for the cap the, for the SIP um, to know how this back and forth has gone. But I I can tell you that uh, like we would say, hey, have you considered a 
a, 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 a more sustainable model and then they would all be like oh we'll come back and then we we, we would get you know a, a a new iteration of their request that that did take it into account so i think the difference here is so i wouldn't anticipate pushback then of course a policy is a policy so who cares about pushback if we design a good policy then department well, heads will do what we i mean i mean we want buy-in of course but yeah. um it's it's if it's a good policy that takes into account all the things that like Rich said and and what is and isn't attainable and all that, you know, I'm not saying disregard um, department heads. I'm saying it, it's, we're kind of already doing it. Um, one point also, I am I have thought for a long time that the city ought to go to a fleet model um, and for this very reason. Um, we also have the ability to take in inventory of... Um, vehicles for just like like running around vehicles not heavy duty vehicles but mm -hmm. uh yeah. through through parking because that's an enterprise we you can't spend parking you can't spend parking money on anything other than parking but we can i have an i i've had this idea for a long time that we could take in more vehicles into the city use them for parking for a couple of years and then rotate them into other um into other departments and build a fleet that way um but it because that already sounds like a great idea i mean well, they're I driving you. around these chevy I'll, bolts. I'll go now. <laughs> they have these chevy bolts that they drive around inside the city that have like a 200 plus mile range you know huge battery relative you know relatively and you know they surely are not using that so yeah if they could cycle that if they could down cycle that to another department or like you said to a whole fleet system yeah and i mean i could even see bringing in like electric pickup trucks and things like that, that, you know, that their, their longer term life will be in another department that needs hmm. that. Um, but um, that's clever. But it's, it really is a constraint that that's an enterprise. You can only spend parking money on parking things, but once it's in the city, well, then it can, it can be repurposed elsewhere. So anyway, that's an idea clever. I've had. Yeah. Um, so I, feel like maybe the takeaway from this is a recommendation from the commission to present this policy and its implementation to the department heads and revise as necessary. Ben, I, I want to make one one suggestion, and I just I just want to say one thing, Ben. When I was at UMass back in the in the late eighties, Selectra gave um, the College of Agriculture two Plymouth Horizon battery vehicles, and we, my group that I was in, Plant and Soil Science, got one. It had a fifteen mile range. We could barely get into town to get a coffee and back to campus. And I remember in my dissertation defense. The group took me in there for lunch before and then pretended that I was out of juice and I was late for my 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 defense. So just a little bit sorry. But the, my point here is I think this document, this draft would benefit in the preamble to just mention something about lifetime life cycle costs at the value, you know, so that there isn't any ambiguity about that. This is also an economic decision. That these are, this is an this is an important change in the way that we manage our resources. In particular, these you know electric vehicles can actually have a lower life cycle cost than internal combustion, and that might help any resistance within within the city in terms of well we can't do these you know we just we just we can't make it we can't make it work because I think I think I think we can. So I would suggest if you could add just something that says something about the economic economics of it that 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 will uh, reinforce the value of the policy mm -hmm. yeah no that that makes sense um so yeah i don't i don't know if there's a need for a formal vote on the recommendation if, if if we think that the sense of of what i took back from the group is is accurately represented then i'll go with what you guys have shared um okay and the 
Last item is Valley Green Energy Update and Feedback, um, which is uh, very briefly, uh, Carolyn, were you there at the whole meeting or did you end up uh, leaving? I, I did have to step out after no. uh, the start. I had a uh, double book. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was a good start to the conversation. Um, but mostly, I think the schedule, probably letting these guys know what the what the schedule is um, um, for rolling that out. Yeah. Um, so the Valley Green Energy is, is the uh, community choice aggregation that Carolyn has been working on on behalf of the city with Amherst and Pelham for many years, right? It's the, it's years plural. Um, and um, and we're very close to to rolling out this opt out system so that the supply portion of your electric bill, if you are in Northampton, would be provided by this community choice aggregation um, unless you opt out and you could go with the basic service from National Grid or with any of the other, uh, quite frankly, mostly scams. Uh, that are out there to, uh, um, to, to, to give you a nice teaser rate. Um, the, the, uh, we don't have a bid yet. There are like preliminary bids. And let me look at the schedule on this uh, starting. Um, should have had this Valley Green Ed Energy final bid meeting is on July 16th. And then we will get bids from suppliers and that will help determine what the price will be. But what I can tell you for Northampton is because we are sharing this with two communities that are on the Eversource or Western Mass Electric Company portion of the, uh, um, of, of the, uh, of the, their electric bill they have a lower basic service. So whatever this rate is, it is going to be lower than the Wamiko or Eversource basic service. Ours is 18 cents per kilowatt hour for residential and going down uh, in a month or so to 16, that's lovely. Theirs is 15 going down to 14, which means that we are going to come in below 14 cents a kilowatt hour, which is going to be a pretty big improvement for Northampton residents. Um, and it will happen uh, 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 in, invisibly for most who just use basic service right now. Um, we will then want to reach out to people who have elected for various other services, including clean choice uh, energy and other, other suppliers to at least give them the opportunity to opt in to Valley Green Energy. Um, it will have a minimum of 10% and probably will be 10% additional uh, renewable energy credits over those that are required by the renewable portfolio standard for the state, which I think is at 32% now. Um, so making that 42%. Um, and, and actually this leads to a question that I'll that I'll put out to the group but um about which I have a pretty strong opinion <laughs> um which is the communities right the the participating communities could require a higher percentage of renewable port, uh, or sorry um renewable energy credits recs i personally recommend against that these are e even though they will all be massachusetts um, uh, tier one recs, which means they're, they're, they're local recs, but they're all from an existing project, which means they don't actually create the addition of a new renewable energy project. Um, they do remove those recs from circulation and that can increase demand for renewable energy credits. Um, so in the market, they could in theory generate it, but because that's not what's really driving investment right now. Um, I think the most important thing is to try and keep prices as low as possible, especially if you want people to electrify heating 
you have to get your electricity price low enough to compete with natural natural gas. So that's my opinion on that. I don't know, Carolyn, am I missing anything? Um, I don't know. I think that that was a really good overview. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's um, the good news is I think, like you said, it'll be competitive. Um, the other piece, though, I think that um, will be important and probably want help from this group is people who are not on the basic service and have these other providers, um, renewable energy providers on their bill, will really have to do some in probably pretty intense outreach because my guess is, I don't know what the percentage is in Northampton, but my guess is there are probably a fair number of people who have already opted into these other um, providers. And so we'd want to do a robust outreach because they're not going to be automatically notified of um, the opportunity to join the this um, choice aggregation. Okay, if we don't have anyone from the commission, um, oh, I see Eric, you, you raised your hand. So Eric Winkler, and then we'll go to Eric Broadbent and Adele Franks. Yeah, so just, just a question about what you said about the, the rec. So the 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 current um, national grid distribution charges, which includes renewable charge and energy efficiency and a host of other distribution, that that's not going to change for for anyone. No, no. When you talk about when you talk about the recs, are you are you simply saying that the cost of of the energy supply is going to be higher because we're going to require? Yeah. Um, a, a greater percentage of renewables, but are you are you confident that it will still be in the sub fourteen cents per kilowatt hour, even at that, even at a higher percentage of recs of, of Here, renewables? Here's why I'm confident: we won't go to the higher percentage of recs if it's going to be higher than the Wamico cost, because Amherst and Pelham are not going to want to voluntarily increase their their cost. <laughs> so it was pretty clear from the discussion that all the representatives of different communities all agreed, we, we like the additional recs, but we're not going to prioritize more recs if it's going to cost more than basic service, in this case, gotcha. for Amherst and Pelham. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's great. Uh, Eric Broadbent? Thanks. Um, re regarding outreach to third-party supply customers, when we went through this previously in another town, we weren't able to get that list. The utilities are not obligated to send that to you, and the providers don't want to give out their... So I don't know if you have a way of knowing um, who to target in that, but it's, a, it's not easy. We called up Green Energy Consumers Alliance and explain what we would like and they they refused to give us their list. So I don't know. Don't have an answer for you. I think we can, I think our consultant told us that we could have that um, list. We just don't, um, there's not gonna be an automatic distribution to those people. Um, and 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 then of course we can also do, you know, we can do more public PSAs kind of um, outreach because many times people don't see stuff in their mail anyway um, or don't know exactly what it is and might throw it out. So I think it we can't just rely on mailing to specific people. That it really has to be sort of broadcast through all the avenues of getting the information and providing opportunities for people to connect and find out exactly what they need to do. You know, we could have that on our website, but we need people to know where to look to make that decision. Great. Oh, it sounds like if you if the broker said so, that's great. Thank you. And you're right, outreach. You can't have too too little outreach. I mean too much. <laughs> Sorry. 
Adele. Thank you. Uh, in addition to the those people who have signed up with an independent supplier, uh, National Grid assumes, considers that people who have signed up for the Green Up program of the National of the Green Consumers Alliance, um, of which there are 382 people in Northampton who have signed up for that Green Up program. They will not be eligible unless they um, disenroll from the Green Up program. Now, Eversource does not consider that Green Up program to be an independent supplier, but for some unknown reason, National Grid does. Hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Hmm. So we might have to generate like a a web page tutorial on how to unenroll and 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 then select Valley Green Energy. That's a good idea. And I don't know if it's allowable or even if we could persuade uh, the DPW to to participate. Is, can we put uh, flyers into say water bills? Most uh, departments can, yeah. you can add things to the bills that go out, but there is, you know, we ha you have to see how many other things are already in the bill. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, th so that's an option. The other thing is it'll take a cycle. I think even once you deselect, you know, green up and then select this one, it'll be a cycle before you get put on is the way I understand it. Okay. Um, we are past our 5.30 time. We used to sometimes run even longer. Um, so I guess I'll ask, are there any department head updates? Um, I don't see anyone. Uh, and I don't have any that are worth, worth anything right now. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Were, were we going to approve the special meeting minutes? That... I, think we, I think we did before you got. Oh, yeah. I apologize. Or no, we did. We did approve them, actually. Yeah. Pretty sure it was the first thing we did. OK, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Second. OK. Uh, do we have to discuss? I'm sorry about the. There's thing. no discussion on adjournment. Good, it's a thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so I guess I'll do call the roll on adjourning. Uh, Commissioner Elkins. Yes. Commissioner Clemmer. Yes. Uh, Carolyn Mish. Yes. Uh, ben Weil. Yes. Uh, Tim Smith. Yes. Richard Parasoliti. Yes. Uh, Angie Gregory. Yes. Eric Winkler. Favor. Uh, Louis Hesbrook. Yes. Uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>